Ethics Committee and Consultation Service, and welcome to Ethics for Lunch. And it looks like there's lots of you here enjoying lunch, and we're thrilled to see all of you. Um, this is a series that has been launched to engage our community to uh, explore issues that are of concern to us, uh, particularly those of us who are practicing um, at the front lines, and to have an opportunity to explore together some of the challenges, the ethical challenges that we face in everyday practice. We are uh, incredibly blessed in our institution to have um, colleagues who are thinking about these issues and who have particular expertise um, that they're willing to share with us, and today is no exception. So I'd like to uh, begin by introducing uh, uh, Dr. Robert Stevens, who is uh, a neurologist, but he's also a member of our Hospital Ethics Committee. He's an Associate Professor of Anesthesiology, Neurology, Neurosurgery, and Radiology. And um, he is an attending physician with Neuroscience Critical Care Unit. And I'm going to ask Robert to introduce his august panel um, to talk about ethics and the un unresponsive patient. Thank you so much, uh, Cinda. Can everybody hear me? Back in the room, yes? So welcome. Uh, I wanted to um, thank the Berman Institute uh, for supporting this event and the previous and upcoming Ethics for Lunch. I think these are great opportunities to discuss uh, some really challenging uh, issues that are encountered in the clinical space uh, and think about some of the uh, dimensions, particularly the ethical, philosophical dimensions of these, uh, of these disorders. Um, I, as Cindy indicated, I, my primary clinical responsibility is in the care of patients with severe neurological injuries. So I do see quite a few patients with brain injuries, stroke, uh, meningitis, uh, and a fair proportion, uh, I would say the majority of the patients that I see are, have an impairment in their level of responsiveness. These people uh, would be described as being in a coma. Um, and the question really arose several years ago in my clinical practice as to, are we really uh, being comprehensive and judicious uh, and fair in the care of these such vulnerable patients who have lost their ability to communicate, have lost their ability to respond in a meaningful way with their environment. And so this led me to actually uh, approach uh, the Johns, Hos Johns Hopkins uh, Hospital <coughs> Ethics Committee, um, of which I've been a member, I think, for the past four years. And I think this has really helped me to sort of think through uh, some of the ethical um, uh, dimensions of the work that I do. And uh, we felt with Cinder that it might be helpful as well to uh, have a session, Ethics for Lunch, uh, which would be entirely dedicated, again, to uh, states of unresponsiveness, states of unconsciousness, and how uh, we can uh, develop an ethical framework for uh, taking care of patients in this condition. Before I, I begin, I'd like to uh, introduce uh, our panel, we're extremely fortunate to have um, a series of experts here. Uh, so uh, moving from the, I guess to the left, from your right, uh, we have uh, Kate Bechtold, who's an associate professor in the Department of Physical Medicine and Rehabilitation, and she directs uh, the Brain Injury and Stroke Rehabilitation Program in, the, in this hospital. I've known Kate for many years, and is absolutely an expert in brain recovery. Um, and uh, to Kate's right, uh, we have Beth uh, Slomin, who's an associate professor uh, in the Department of Psychiatry. She co-directs uh, the uh, Center for Brain Injury in the Kennedy Krager uh, Institute, and I think she's going to provide us with an extremely valuable uh, pediatric perspective uh, on uh, brain injury recovery and uh, disorders of consciousness. And then moving to the center, we have um, Dr. Peter Kaplan. Peter Kaplan is a professor of neurology. He uh, is uh, the former uh, chair of neurology at Bayview Medical Center, and he is really one of the world's leading experts in uh, neural prognostication and in uh, uh, encephalopathy. And it's really a great privilege to have Dr. Kaplan here with us 
Uh, to Dr. Kaplan's right, we have uh, Adam Scavi. Adam Scavi is one of my colleagues in neurocritical care. He's an assistant professor of uh, anesthesiology and uh, neurology. Uh, and I'm really grateful for him taking uh, an hour out of his very good business schedule today, uh, managing some very, very sick patients and numerous demands coming from different parts of the hospital. And last but not least, we have uh, John Panella. John is a reverend. Uh, he is a uh, senior uh, family advocate uh, and uh, a member of the Department of Pastoral Care. John actually really works very closely with us in the intensive care unit in taking care of um, you know, uh, seriously injured patients and uh, their uh, often distressed families. So I've known John for many years and he's been an incredible resource in terms of understanding the family dimensions uh, in the uh, Again, these very vulnerable uh, patients. So um, I'm hoping that we can make this an interactive session. And uh, if you feel like I'm blabbing on a little bit too long, please feel free to raise your hand and ask a question or interrupt me. Uh, we do want to engage uh, you guys in terms of questions that you might have. I'm not sure that we can answer them, but at least if we can ask some really good questions, maybe this could uh, lead us to some interesting uh, future sessions. Uh, and also the same applies, of course, to the uh, panel. Please feel free to interrupt if there's anything uh, that uh, you want to say or you want to clarify. So I think the way that uh, this uh, ethics for lunch uh, is uh, structured is usually we begin with a case, a vignette, uh, that we try to describe in uh, broad terms. Uh, and we use that as a kind of um, uh, launching pad to uh, elicit some of the discussion around uh, the, the topic of the day. I, mean, I do have a few slides that I'll go through quickly on states of unresponsiveness uh, afterwards, and that, that shouldn't take more than uh, five or 10 minutes. I'm showing you here uh, two CT scans. These are two separate patients. Both of them give me permission to uh, show you their CAT scans. Both of these are individuals who sustain severe traumatic brain injuries. On the left, uh, you have a young man, 26 years old. I think you have a description of this case who uh, was admitted following a motor vehicle crash. Uh, he had arrived in the uh, Hopkins ED in a coma, unresponsive, and uh, was admitted to the neuropsychological care unit. Developed numerous complications, including brain swelling, high pressure inside the head, had to have a, a, a procedure to remove the skull to relieve the pressure, and then went on to have numerous other complications, including infections and organ failure. Uh, he was in the, uh, in the ICU for uh, a total of four and a half weeks, uh, and then uh, was discharged um, to a coma stimulation center. So this uh, gentleman uh, was in a coma throughout his, uh, throughout his stay in the, in the ICU. And um, he, uh, there were, I remember having numerous discussions with, uh, with the members of his family, with his distressed parents, about his current state, about his prognosis, uh, about the goals of the care, uh, about what was actually happening to the patient. Uh, and we can come back to some of these questions, but I remember that these were this patient that took care of several years ago, and these, the questions that the family was asking were extremely relevant and really made me think a lot more about uh, the work that I do. And on the right, uh, uh, probably a fairly similar period cat scan. This is a different patient. A little bit older, 32 years old, who also was involved in a motor vehicle accident um, and had a very similar presentation, uh, arrived in a coma, had multiple contusions or bruises on the brain. Uh, unfortunately, this patient did not do well uh, and uh, developed a refractory um, intracranial hypertension, was not felt to be a candidate for surgery, uh, and ultimately expired in, in the ICU after two weeks. So you can just get a sense of how difficult and challenging these patients can be and how sometimes the uh, early decisions that are made uh, can have a really important impact on uh, survival and maybe on, on outcome. Just to give you a little bit of um, follow-up, the patient on the left that I mentioned was 26-year-old. So I went to, to, to coma stimulation. Eventually, actually, over a period of two to three weeks, uh, emerged um, and uh, became interactive. Uh, and really had a very uh, spectacular recovery, uh, was able to, uh, over a period of six months, uh, engage in a very aggressive rehabilitation program. I'm hoping that um, our uh, 
members of the panel here, Dr. Slovy and Dr. Bentos, will be able to talk to us a little bit more about what can be done for these patients. But uh, he was able to return uh, to his prior level of activity. He was a law student and uh, was able to complete law school. He's now working in a, um, um, a large law firm here in Baltimore. So um, it just goes to show that you know we, we often are um, uncertain and unclear about uh, the prognosis of these patients in the early phase. So when we talk about unresponsiveness, we inevitably talk about um, unconsciousness. And consciousness is a very perplexing problem. It's a problem for philosophy, it's a problem for ethics, it's also a problem for neuroscience, it's a problem for clinicians. Uh, and um, you know, you, you probably uh, don't know two people who don't have this, who have the same definition of what consciousness is. It's actually quite difficult to define what is consciousness. And in the clinical realm, we tend to um, to go the easy way, which is to try to define consciousness in terms of what it is not, right? And so, um, and, and it, in fact, those descriptions that we make of states of unconsciousness are really not so much states of unconsciousness as, as they are states of unresponsiveness. Um, and I really want to emphasize this point because I think it has relevance not only in clinical terms but also in ethical terms. When we talk about consciousness, it's not the same thing as responsiveness, right? So when we have access to the bedside, when we stand at the bedside, when we sit at the bedside, when we engage with a patient, uh, is really um, motor responsiveness. Um, and someone can be responsive from a motor standpoint, but not necessarily conscious, okay? And somebody can be conscious, but unresponsive uh, in terms of motor responsiveness. So I think it's really, really important for us to disentangle these two, these two things. Again, uh, one can appear unconscious and yet be conscious, one can be responsive and yet be unconscious. Uh, and I don't want to confuse things too much, but I'm going to give you a few slides to sort of illustrate this concept. In, in the hospital setting, um, we frequently uh, encounter patients who have an alteration or a, a, a decrease in responsiveness. Um, and this can be, for example, simply patients that are sleeping, uh, which is a physiologic form of unresponsiveness. Uh, but it can also be patients, for example, in the operating room under general anesthesia. Uh, and uh, this, of course, is something which is happening every day, all the time. Literally hundreds of patients every, uh, every single week are coming through the hospital system here undergoing general anesthesia. And do we often, perhaps not often enough, do we think about what are the specific cognitive and neural characteristics of this general anesthetic state? That's one thing. And more importantly, are we really very confident that these patients who are under general anesthesia are not capable of some form of cortical processing? In fact, uh, the data would suggest otherwise, that uh, there is a subset, and this is the scary part, I think many of you have heard about this, there is a small subset of patients who, again, in terms of their external phenotype, in terms of their motor responsiveness, appear to be asleep, they appear to be under general anesthesia, but in fact, they may retain some elements of cortical processing. They may be able to, for example, if they are uh, presented with a list of words, they are may be able to uh, present, once they wake up, they may be able to repeat those words in a manner that is non-random, uh, and suggesting that they were able, uh, again, to uh, retain some of the elements during anesthesia. So, it's really, really important to remember that the general anesthetic state, um, you know, which we think in terms of being equivalent to sleep or in terms of being equivalent to coma, in fact, is a completely different state, qualitatively, quantitatively, uh, and that there may be elements of you know, persisting uh, consciousness that occur at least in some patients, certainly not all, but maybe a small subset of patients. Now, um, it's probably no secret to many of you that the people with generalized seizures and I'm sure Dr. Kaplan can comment on this more, but either patients with generalized seizures or patients with complex partial seizures may have a profound impairment in, um, in responsiveness and in consciousness. And uh, these individuals uh, may actually appear to be in a coma. In fact, what is driving the coma is uh, the fact that they are seizing. Uh, often the seizures initially may present as motor motor seizures with convulsions and, and uh, twitching, but over a period of time, often those motor uh, manifestations disappear and you're left with a patient who is just 
unconscious or unresponsive. And the only way to really detect the seizures and ascertain the cause of unconsciousness is to do an EEG. Um, and so, so certainly seizures is probably accounts for a significant proportion of states of unresponsiveness in, uh, in hospitalized patients. And then there are, of course, a broad category, and again, here I'm going to refer to my colleague, Dr. Kaplan, mm -hmm. patients with encephalopathy. These are people with profound metabolic disturbances, with severe infections outside the brain, uh, who uh, develop an encephalopathy. They may be lethargic, they may be stuporous. They're not responding normally, uh, and uh, this is certainly a major cause. And then last but not least, there is a uh, the patients that we take care of uh, in the neuroscience critical care unit, these are folks with primary neurological injuries and insults, people with stroke, people with hemorrhage in their brain, people with uh, you know, traumatic brain injury. These are folks who have structural damage in the brain, and uh, the damage involves structures, for example, deep in the brain stem that may affect their arousal or may uh, disrupt the networks uh, up uh, in the cortex and impair awareness. Uh, but anyway, this, this is a, uh, certainly the category that we most commonly asso associate with unresponsiveness. And just to be very you know, brief, I'm, I'm sure that many of you have heard of these specific categories, phenotypic categories of individuals with um, a state with unresponsiveness. Uh, and so we commonly differentiate between coma, which is a state that occurs acutely um, and uh, essentially is characterized by unresponsive unarousability. These are folks whose eyes are closed, uh, they don't have purposeful responses, they don't follow commands. Uh, and uh, usually uh, the coma is either due to a metabolic uh, disturbance, so for example if you have profound, profoundly decreased sodium concentrations in the blood, this may lead to a state of unconsciousness or it could be due to uh, a structural uh, injury, for example, a stroke involving uh, the, the brainstem. But patients in a coma generally uh, resolve, so the coma is not a permanent state. You hear people saying sometimes, oh, you know, uh, there's this patient who's been in a coma for three years. I don't think most of the experts would agree with that, that terminology. Usually, coma evolves to something else, either uh, the patient will emerge and wake up progressively, or the patient will uh, actually uh, evolve into a chronic state of unconsciousness. And what are these chronic states of unconsciousness? Well, there's really two. Uh, one of them is called the vegetative state. You've perhaps heard this term, uh, which has some sort of uh, stigma and some connotations. And some people, uh, took care of my colleague, uh, Stephen Lores from Liège in Belgium, and his group have advocated for another term, which is the unresponsive wakefulness syndrome. These are synonymous terms. So these are folks who intermittently will open their eyes. So they have elements of arousal. Uh, you walk into the room, you might see a vegetative patient with his eyes open. Um, but they don't have any meaningful interaction with their environment. They're not able to follow commands. They will not track. They will not attend when you, uh, when you present a stimulus. Uh, they will not uh, be able to use their, uh, their arms in a, in a, or their legs in a purposeful fashion. So vegetative patients, again, uh, the most characteristic feature is that they have cyclic opening of the eyes, cyclic periods of arousal, but they do not have any meaningful engagement, and certainly no language. Now, this is to be distinguished from a category of patients that has been identified more recently, perhaps in the past 20 years. These are patients who, at least superficially, would seem to look very much like patients in a vegetative state. They open their eyes intermittently. But these are folks who intermittently, but in an inconsistent fashion, um, will be able to engage meaningfully. So from time to time, maybe once every week, maybe once every two weeks, maybe once a day, they'll, able, they'll be able to do something that actually uh, appears to suggest that there, there is some impact of cortical processing. So for example, they might say something that is contextually relevant. They may smile. They may look around the room. Uh, they may, uh, you know, they may, uh, Cry. Uh, these are features that suggest that maybe there is some uh, cortical processing that is actually responsive to the environment. Uh, and the thing about minimally conscious patients, however, is that they don't do this in a reliable fashion. So you may walk into the room and say, you know, uh, give me a thumbs up, and the patient gives you a thumbs up. But then for a week, uh, this patient will not do anything. So it's inconsistent. It's not reliably. Uh, you're not able to reproduce it in a reliable fashion. 
And this is to be distinguished from another state, which is the EMCS, or emerged from the minimally conscious state. These are folks who have recovered um, essentially um, a, a system, or, or a, 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 a person, not persistent, but a, a reliable uh, ability to communicate, a reliable ability to use, uh, to, to have um, object use. Uh, and so the EMCS state is something which has been even more recently characterized and is kind of interesting that uh, we are able to make all these different um, categorizations using phenotypic characterizations. Now, I want to also talk about uh, another group of patients that you, I'm certain, have heard about, and these are the locked-in patients. So what does it mean when we say locked-in? Locked-in means uh, that uh, there is a loss of efferent motor control. So essentially, the motor system is wiped out. It, typically, the most characteristic lesion is when you have uh, a stroke, for example, involving the, um, the anterior portion of the brain stem, um, and uh, the corticospinal tract is being damaged, so there is no motor output, but cognitive processing and sensory inputs are preserved. So these are folks who are fully aware, fully conscious, but they are unable to execute a motor response. In the, in the most classic descriptions, the only remaining response that they have is upward movements of the eyes and maybe blinking of the eyes. But you can also have a totally locked-in state in which there is no motor response, not even blinking of the eyes, not even upward or vertical eye movements, nothing at all. And yet these folks uh, remain uh, conscious. And so this is a, uh, you know, uh, kind of an interesting um, product, I would say, of modern medicine. We resuscitate these individuals. We keep them, we are able to maintain physiology through the acute phase, and then they end up in a state where they're locked in, essentially. So they're able to process information, but not able to uh, generate a useful output. Now, this is beginning to change. This is beginning to change, of course, with the utilization of brain and computer interfaces and uh, enhanced communication that is coming from, uh, you know, uh, especially researchers and engineers working in the rehabilitation uh, phase. So, this slide just gives you a uh, kind of a snapshot of, this is a PET scan that was conducted in four different individuals. Uh, so upper right hand, upper left hand corner you have a normal individual. Um, and then to the right, upper right hand corner you have a patient who's in a vegetative state. So this is an FTG PET scan that essentially measures regional metabolic activity. You can see that in the vegetative patients there's a global decrease in metabolic activity, which involves the hemispheres, involves also the subcortical structures, the brain stem. And then uh, below the vegetative, you see the mentally conscious patient. You can see that uh, metabolic activity is sort of somewhat in between the normal healthy control and the vegetative patient. So there is some metabolic activity, but it's significantly diminished. Um, and then in the lower left hand corner, you have the uh, patient who is locked in, and you can see that it is, for all intents and purposes, identical to the uh, uh, PET scan obtained in the healthy control. Uh, so, and this again speaks to the, what I was saying earlier, patients who are locked in maintain all of their uh, cortical resources, simply they are not able to execute uh, a motor command due to uh, damage to the motor system. And this slide which is taken from uh, my colleague Nico Shin from uh, Colombia um, kind of provides you with an overview of these different states. And very briefly, because I don't want to spend too much time on this, you can see that uh, on the x axis you have increasing levels of cognitive function, and on the y axis you have increasing levels of motor function. And so, uh, way down on the, uh, on the lower end of the left, left lower portion of the slide, you see brain death, which is a complete loss of all uh, neurological, all brain and brain stem function. Uh, and in the upper right hand corner you have uh, full cognitive recovery. And in between you have these different states, again, coma, vegetative state, and really conscious state, uh, confusional states, uh, different uh, patterns of recovery which can be associated with different levels, again, of motor responsiveness and different levels of cognitive function. And you can see that uh, at the uh, bottom right hand corner you have complete locked-in state. And these are folks, again, who have full cognitive function but have no motor, no motor response. Does that make sense? Does this sort of diagram make sense? Okay. So just a couple more slides to give you a little bit of a flavor of some of the 
the recent research on disorders of consciousness and some of the potential ethical um, you know, dilemmas that, that this research elicits. So this is a widely publicized study. It's published in the, the Lancet about five years ago. Uh, somewhat controversial, but nevertheless, this was done using high-density EEG. So the researchers placed 256 EEG um, electrodes on the head uh, of a series of patients who are classified clinically as being either vegetative or minimally conscious. Um, and uh, they asked these subjects to execute a motor command. They said, imagine that uh, you are squeezing your right hand into a fist and then relaxing it, okay? They asked them to do this, but clearly these patients were unresponsive. They were not able to, to, to execute the motor command. But they reported, uh, again, the regional uh, EEG patterns. And what they found was that in a subset, approximately 5% of this cohort, uh, the subjects were able to induce a pattern of activation that was identical to healthy controls. Okay? So it, this was very intriguing, and many people commented on this, but it looked like they were able to follow the commands not by a motor response, but by the activation pattern in their brain. And this is a technique that is referred to as mental imagery, uh, and it's now actually quite widely used in uh, some centers in terms of assessing uh, patients with disorders of consciousness. Another way to do it is using functional MRI. And uh, this is also a widely published study which looked at the functional MRI pattern in uh, a series of 50 patients with severe brain injuries, either from trauma or from uh, anoxic brain injuries, or folks who were neurologically devastated, clinically appeared to be completely unresponsive, all of them. And again, what these authors found independently is that a subset of patients were able to activate the brain uh, using fMRI in a way that really appeared quasi-normal. It was analogous to what was seen in, uh, in the healthy volunteers. Uh, and so these authors took it even one step further and they said, okay, we're going to try to set up a very kind of basic language. There's going to be two different scenarios. One scenario is we want you guys to imagine. I want you to imagine that you are walking through the different rooms of your house. Okay? And you there's a certain reproducible pattern of brain activation that occurs. And the other scenario is, I want you to imagine that you're playing tennis. And this really engages very different parts of the brain, and the pattern on fMRI is quite different. And so in that subset, again, this is 5%, uh, so uh, a very small number of, of individuals. In that subset of patients who were able to uh, generate a normal response, they said, okay, so, since you're able to generate these patterns in your brain, we're going to say walking through your house is a yes, and playing tennis is a no. So we're going to ask you some questions. And so they went through this routine uh, with these, again, this very small subset of patients, and they said things like, well, is your name Alexander? Is your father's name Prescott? You know, do you come from, uh, from uh, Boise, Illinois, et cetera, et cetera. And so then the, the, uh, the, um, uh, they were able to find that these individuals were able to respond uh, in, I think, approximately 70% of the time accurately. So again, uh, these are folks who, you know, if you went to the bedside and you uh, tried to engage with them, you would get absolutely nothing. They would appear agitated or really conscious. And yet, uh, using, again, the interposition of a brain, a functional MRI in the brain, you were able to uh, engage with some, some degree of communication. And there's much more sophisticated <coughs> ways uh, that are being developed now to allow these individuals potentially to communicate. So, just to sort of sum up, um, I think you know one thing that is really important to, to to sort of bear in mind is that clinical phenotypes are not really very accurate uh, classifiers of the, of the neural state. So, for example, as I was saying earlier, just if you just stood at the bedside, somebody who is sleeping looks pretty much identical to somebody who is under anesthesia, and it looks identical to somebody who is in a coma. Without engaging, without engaging with the subject, you're not able to differentiate these states. When you do a neurological exam, uh, in many ways, the anesthesia, the state of general anesthesia, is uh, quite similar to what we see in patients with coma. And then, like I was saying earlier, the clinical characteristics that we use, the clinical criteria we use to differentiate between different disorders of consciousness, such as vegetative or minimally conscious, uh, etc., 
are not totally accurate because we know that some patients who are classified on clinical terms as being in vegetative state are actually able to elicit this mental imagery in a very reliable fashion and even communicate. Uh, so clearly these individuals are not vegetative, vegetative in the classic sense. Um, and so this, this really ties in with the, the idea that uh, you know, unresponsive patients may have elements of cortical processing which are analogous to what is observed in awake healthy volunteers. And the last thing, and perhaps one of the most important things, is that in the current state of the art in terms of prognostication, so which you know, includes things like neurological assessment, EEG, MRI, uh, evoked potentials, even using the best possible uh, tests in the, in the most sophisticated centers, our ability to prognosticate accurately is still quite limited. So uh, this, uh, this slide gives you a sense of uh, the accuracy of neuroprognostication in a series of different types of acute brain injury, including stroke, subarachnoid hemorrhage, intracerebral hemorrhage, anoxic brain injury, traumatic brain injury. And I just want you to focus on the, uh, the column that's always the right which gives you the, uh, either the area under the receiver after a ca characteristic curve um, for the cease of the state, or it gives you the false positive rate. So essentially, what the AUC is, is shows you the, how well your study or your test discriminates between outcome categories. Okay, so the higher your AUC, given the AUC of one, it means that 100% of the time, your test or your multivariable prognostic model will predict whether your patient is going to do well, recover, or whether your patient is not going to do well. If your AUC is 0.7, that means 70% of the time you're going to be correct, 30% of the time you're going to be incorrect. As you can see, the vast majority of these prognostic systems that are currently in use have an AUC of 0 0.7, 0 0.8, maybe at the best 0.85. That means that 15, 20, 30% of the time using, again, the state-of-the-art prognostic tools <laughs> Uh, we get it totally wrong. We are incorrect in classifying patients in the acute setting. Uh, and this, I think, is, is, is very troubling. Um, because uh, if we're not accurately prognosticating, then uh, you know, what, what should the priorities be for us? So I think I'm going to stop here because uh, that's uh, been a bit long. But I, I would like, uh, you know, first of all, to um, uh, pause and see if there's any questions from the audience. And then I'm going to engage with our panel members as well. But just preliminarily, any questions about uh, about this presentation? <coughs> Nothing at all. Everything is clear. I I did want to uh, just while we're having a discussion, I wanted to show this slide, which contains some of the questions that we often see in the acute setting of patients with brain injury who have disorders of consciousness. Uh, and you can read this, and I think it's also available on your, um, on your, on your handouts. But uh, you know, the, the, these are the questions that we, we encounter on a daily basis, things like, you know, is he going to survive? But even more importantly, uh, will, will he or she wake up? And when they wake up, uh, what is he or she going to look like? What sort of you know, neurologic function, what sort of cognitive function will he or she have? And we can make some predictions, but again, we're not always that good. Um, there's also questions that arise very frequently in the clinical realm, such as in a patient who's in a coma, I'll often hear family members saying, is he in pain, or can he hear what we're saying? Um, and what sort of tests can we utilize to probe consciousness? Um, and uh, again, uh, you know, we have some answers to these questions, but often, I think we're not that accurate. So I'm going to pause here and I'm going to ask maybe Dr. Kaplan to, uh, to come forward. Maybe just tell us a little bit about your, um, your thoughts about prognostication and the acute setting of brain injury. Do you think we're, we're doing well or do you think we can do much better? Well, we should be able to do much better. Can we do much better with what we have? I don't think so. Uh, to make an overall statement for prognostication, it almost entirely depends on the cause of the patient's coma. Because if the person has had anesthesia, pretty much 100% of people will wake up or a barbiturate overdose if you support their body systems. If you're in coma for 
uh, a period of time of over six hours after a cardiac arrest, your heart has stopped, and uh, you have no brainstem function, then largely 100% of those patients will not recover normally. So you have a range, depending on the cause, the etiology, between 0 and 100%. And also, it depends on what residual findings you find on the clinical exam. So once you have the cause, and you have a clinical examination by, let's say, a neurologist or a neurointensivist that involves interacting with the patient and examining certain reflexes, then you can probably get, for a number of causes, etiologies like cardiac arrest, a 90-95% understanding of what the prognosis is. My specialty is heart-stopping anoxic coma. And with that, we have easy-to-hand studies, such as the brainwave test, the EEG, and a test of the sensory cortex, where you stimulate the wrist with a noxious or painful stimulus that goes all the way up the nervous system, and if you have any function in your sensory cortex, that sensory cortex will register a response. So with those two tests, for example, within 48 hours of your heart stopping, if you have no response to a noxious stimulus, virtually 100%, meaning 99.5% of people will not return to consciousness. So I just, for this moment, I won't occupy more time, with this one paradigm, meaning a specific cause, cardiac arrest with anoxia, a clinical exam, a known history that they had a, their heart stop and not just their breathing stop, and the two tests, along with the clinical exam, you can make a highly accurate prognostication. Pretty much every other clinical scenario, meaning cause, meaning circumstance, will have a less reliable predictability of outcome than what I've just described. I'll stop there. Is there any questions for uh, Dr. Calvary? How about the function uh, MRI? So the specific correlations of different MRI. Could you just repeat the question? I'm sorry, maybe everybody can hear us. Uh, okay, yeah. My question is about, you know, how about the uh, functional MRI uh, role in this uh, you know, evaluation? So, briefly, you know, if a patient uh, under the post-traumatic traumatic you know, edema, maybe, you know, at, uh, functional MRI will be short something. Maybe you can get in your you know, treatment. So that's my question. How about this So the question involves a different cause of coma. It's post-traumatic. And the understanding of how accurate our tools are for prognostication are less accurate in traumatic coma, largely because with trauma you have multiple areas of brain injury with islands, presumably, of preserved brain function. With your heart stopping, the entire brain is exposed to the effect of no oxygen and oxygen. So the entire brain is affected. So prognostication with head trauma is a lot more challenging. And to a certain degree, we do rely uh, on, on well, in, in most hospitals, almost entirely on our clinical examination with some support of EEG. Since my area is EEG, I can explain that the EEG is not reliable except at the extremes of EEG findings. By that I mean the EEG shows the patient is awake, but for some reason we're not able to get through to the patient clinically. It may show that the patient is sleeping, and therefore their unresponsive state overwhelmingly, because the EEG shows the overwhelming picture of multiple causes, or rather multiple possibilities, that they are asleep. Or it can show there's a lot of electrical abnormal activity in the form of seizures, which acts like static on a radio. If you're listening to the radio, you can't hear the message 
for the static. So the EEG will give you that, but then as we get to fewer and fewer examples, you end up saying, well, it's not one, not two, not three. What happens then? And it's in those in-between cases which form a very small number of the total cases of coma in trauma, in anoxia. You have a little bit of evidence that not all is lost. And in those cases, there is an increasing understanding with fMRI. But a lot of centers don't have it available. The data are not correlated universally. And therefore, it remains on a case-by-case -case basis. It sheds some light by saying, yes, there's certain areas that functionally are lighting up. But it doesn't tell you quite, uh, in terms of the patient's function, what they will be able to recover and what they will behave like should they recover slightly. Unless, it, again, it's the extreme, extremely dark, extremely dark. So thank you very much for the question, Dr. Kaplan. We, we have actually an ongoing study here where we're obtaining functional MRIs in patients with, uh, with severe traumatic brain injury. We have some preliminary data, we haven't published it yet, but we, we, our observation is that traumatic brain injury is associated with very prominent damage to white matter tracts, so the connections between different parts of the cortex and subcortical structures. Uh, are disrupted uh, as a result of the shearing forces that occur in trauma. And this is manifested as uh, a disruption of functional connectivity. So when we acquire the functional MRI in these patients, we see that uh, a lot of the networks that you can identify quite clearly in healthy people are disrupted. Uh, the uh, intrinsic coherence or connectivity, uh, the normal architecture of the brain is, is kind of thrown into disarray. Um, and I think, I think uh, you know, although Dr. Kelsen is right, this has not been validated as a prognostic biomarker, certainly I think there's a lot of interesting work that can be done in that, in that area. But I, I wanted to engage other members of our panel and, and um, also maybe deal with this question of uncertainty. Dr. Kelsen outlined that in the setting of anoxic brain injury, we, especially when the findings are quite stark, we can usually make a fairly accurate prognos prognosis. But in many, many other settings, for example, after trauma or after other types of injury, stroke, um, aneurysmal rupture, we're not so good. We have to deal with a high level of uncertainty. And I'd like for you to ask uh, Dr. Dr. Schiavi, because he uh, sort of uh, does the same kind of job as I do, and we often have to meet families in this hyper acute phase, just a few hours after the injuries occur, uh, and provide them with some elements that can help them deal with this, uh, with this, uh, this dramatic event. Dr. Stanley, maybe you could comment on how do we deal with uncertainty uh, with regards to these, these very uh, injured patients? Uncertainty is, is time limited, of course. I mean, the closer you are to the injury, the more uncertainty there is. Uh, and in the ICU, we deal with the very acute situation. Um, what's happening in the seconds after injury, minutes, hours, days, sometimes weeks, uh, occasionally months uh, after uh, after an injury, and when dealing with the uncertainty from a clinical point of view, uh, we take the normal approach that any clinician who is uh, aggressively treating a patient is, you continue down that path and you continue to treat, unless of course told otherwise by the, by the patient or the representative. Uh, so the uncertainty as far as outcome doesn't matter that much in the acute phase when you're doing the treatment for it. Your goal is to preserve life at that moment, to get uh, over the acute problem hemodynamic instability, uh, intracranial hypertension uh, that if left untreated could lead to a herniation syndrome and eventually brain death due to total uh, global ischemia of the brain. And so uh, the uncertainty in that regard uh, doesn't really affect us clinicians that much early on. But what it does affect profoundly is the family and the representatives of the family and the decision makers, surrogates, all that we come with uh, the patient who want information about, well, what do we do now? How long should we wait? Uh, is he going to get better? Is he going to die? Uh, things like that. And these questions, uh, similarly, are very, very difficult to uh, answer uh, early on. The further down the road you get, of course, uh, the easier it is to uh, approximate what could ultimately be the outcome. And so a good structure 
to think about is, uh, is how, how do you define what is acute care versus moving towards more chronic care? And this is, in my mind, one of the break points uh, where, and in, in my mind, I think about it just superficially and an easy way to categorize it. I think about the two weeks time period, two weeks of acute ICU care. Uh, once you've gotten past that two weeks, unless there's other problems like the emergence of a pneumonia or some other problem that occurred after the initial injury. Uh, after this two week period of time for acute care, uh, you are now starting to shift towards more chronic care types of things that are gonna have to be maintained and then prevention of further problems like infections and uh, other things like that other organ dysfunction. And so uh, how do you deal with the family in this regard? Uh, in general, you have to just make sure that you are completely transparent about what you're doing, what you intend to do, what you are capable of doing, and what you will not do. Uh, all things have to, all those things have to be discussed with the family. So, for instance, in an acute injury, a patient comes in who made it very clear that if there was not 100% chance of complete recovery, and I would go back to my normal state no matter what, uh, but they had a very severe injury with damage to critical parts of the brain that you know can't recover. If this family were going to make a decision and tell you, uh, you know, my family member, the person who just got injured, would not want to be treated at all in this situation. Uh, you're gonna explore that and figure out why, but uh, you're going to have this conversation openly and enlist help from colleagues as well about do we actually honor this wish and stop treating early on. Again, later on, it gets a little bit more clear uh, if you're going to limit uh, goals of treatment. Uh, but in the early phase, it can, be, it can be very problematic. So being transparent, having open communication, explaining all the things that are possible, what can be done and what can't be done and what won't be done, uh, and then having a reasonable discussion with a family that you have made an assessment is capable of hearing and understanding, isn't suffering their own traumatic uh, mental state because of what has just happened to their family member, of course, you have to make sure that they're capable of uh, coherently and intelligently talking about these things. And then make sure that everybody's goals are pointed in the same direction. What is our goal for treating this patient? Is it for a cure, for wake up, uh, for a return to normal function, for uh, life sustaining only, that if there's any life at all, that that life is worth preserving? Uh, whatever the goals are, it doesn't really matter what they are, frankly, as long as everybody's thinking in the same direction, uh, then uh, it makes it far more clear, but you have to be very transparent about it. That's uh, sort of a skimming the surface, rock skimming across the top view of, of the, the way I structure it in my mind in dealing with acute situations as they move towards chronic. But the two-week period for me is uh, one of the big break points. Thank you very much. So I want, I want to ask um, Dr. Bento, because Dr. Bento kind of sits <clears throat> downstream. So she inherits a lot of the patients that we see in the acute setting. She sees them weeks, months later, um, and she has to, in a sense, she has this readout of what's happened, uh, and she has to engage with these patients to try to maximize their recovery. But just in, in terms of your, your clinical experience, do you, do you get the sense that, um, Dr. Michael, that we sometimes get it totally wrong, that, for example, we perseverated and uh, aggressively resuscitated a patient who has really no, no prospect for meaningful recovery, or on the other hand, that you know, we almost missed the diagnosis on a patient who actually has a very good chance to do sometimes, because you have this kind of, uh, this hindsight that we don't have. I wonder what your perspective is on, on what we do with the kids in So that, that's a value-based, belief-based, ethic-based question right there. <laughs> it's in the sense that what's the value of life? And what's been interesting, um, you know, I have been in the ICUs all, and all the way through my career, and yes, um, last decade plus I've focused in the post-acute uh, setting realm, uh, is having individuals who have said emphatically, you know, I, didn't, I don't want to be resuscitated if this progresses or, you know, if, if this is, you know, kind of impairment comes, and then them being in that place and saying, no, I want to live. And so it's, the value of life is an individually defined, um, experience for someone, and um, it, it, I would say it's not for us to, to define that. And so 
hearing the comments that you're, you're with families who are struggling with that definition, given what that individual may have stated about what is important to them, what is the value of life, what is the definition of a good life or life worth living. Um, it, it's interesting to hear in the early pages the definition of, of uh, being, giving a prognosis and what is chronic, um, because in that realm, the human has to be alive in order for us to move forward with them, right? So it's, it's about surviving. And um, for us that are in the ICU settings, us as in rehabilitationists who are in the ICU setting, from day one we're looking at helping that person thrive and recover to the best level of functioning that is possible for that individual. And so that prognostication now takes a different level. It takes on a level of what is this individual going, how are they going to be able to interact, to act, to um, engage in life in meaningful ways. And so, um, so Robert, I said you got it right all the time. Um, it, it, you know, those individuals are coming to a place and I haven't met a person even who has profound disabilities, motor, sensory, cognitive, who didn't say, I, I want to live. Um, so, so I, I just, this, this is great, and I'd like to <clears throat> do a quick poll because I can you guys. So you remember that I described to you earlier this locked-in state. Does everybody remember what a locked-in state is? <clears throat> so these are the folks who are awake, they're completely awake, able to process information, but they are not able to move anything, right? So they're locked in. So if I, if I said to you, and this is just a thought experiment, but you could choose, you have a devastating injury, you could choose between dying versus living for years in a locked in state. Who would prefer to, to die? Okay, it looks like an overwhelming majority. Who would prefer to continue living in a locked in state? Couple, three? Okay, okay. So this, this is a, you know, this is very interesting. I think the vast majority of people, especially people who work in the, you know, in the health uh, industry, in the healthcare environment, or providers, um, many of them would state exactly what you stated by an overwhelming majority, that you would rather not live in the state of uh, a locked in state. But um, if you actually, there's some really good studies that have been conducted, and this ties in with Dr. what Dr. Bechtold was mentioning, studies that are looking at the quality of life of locked in patients. There's communities of locked in patients who, you know, are able to comment on their, uh, on their life, who, there are people who are locked in who have written books, um, and many of them feel that they actually can have a meaningful existence in spite of uh, having such severe and dramatic and uh, you know a really definitive functional loss. Uh, so I think it, it really, although many of us right now, you know, the majority of us are healthy and you know we, we enjoy being fully functional. When you get to that state uh, where you have a severe injury. The decision-making process often uh, is changed a bit, and we see this all the time in the clinical realm, where you have families who initially say uh, it would be unacceptable for my family member to not return to their uh, original state, and then over time and after discussion and after reflection, you see them beginning to shift a little and saying, well, you know, I think uh, if, if uh, he's in a wheelchair, but he's still able to have meaningful interactions with his grandchildren, maybe it's worthwhile nevertheless. And so I'm not quite sure whether that shift uh, in point of view is a good thing or a bad thing, but it's something that we do see quite often. Would you agree? So. Yeah, I, I would just encourage everybody, if you haven't seen The Diamond Fell the Butterfly, to watch the movie. And there's other movies that, that, that help you to get some perspective of what it is to experience a disability in all its various forms. And, and it, it, it can help you to, to step into another individual's shoes and understand that life meaning really isn't individually defined and it evolves across your life. What you thought was meaningful and really important when you were in your 20s, um, it, it can be dramatically different you know, decades later. And, so, um, and also depending on life circumstances. Do you have any thoughts, questions, ideas? Yes, ma'am. I'm a little perplexed. If um, you guys said if a person comes in and has advanced directives and declare that they don't want anything done given this incident, it sounds like you're still going to proceed to do something. I, I, I can answer that. Right. So, uh, in the ultra in the acute phase, this is why I think about two seconds, two minutes, two hours, two days, kind of thing. Uh, ultimately, in the initial resuscitation, uh, the answer 
pretty much always yes, unless explicitly told the answer is no. Uh, what Kay's talking about is sort of a, it, it's a self-fulfilling uh, prophecy because people that are awake and can communicate with you and are integrated enough to explain that they shift their preference, it's self-selecting. And so this is a portion of the people, right? And so um, it, it's, you have to be very careful with saying, well, people that actually lived to be interactive would say, I'm glad I'm alive. Of course they would, because they're alive. And they're working and they're interacting. Um, it's the people that can't interact uh, that are not self-selected for are the ones that really the ethical ones come up with. Now, to get specific to your question, if somebody had explicit instructions, do not save my life, do not resuscitate me, it's actually a crime to not do so. And we typically do not. Because that's why it's even crimes. <laughs> <laughs> Any other um, ideas? So I just would like to add from the pediatric <coughs> perspective yes. of I think one of the things that's different when you're working with children is children can't make their own decisions, so then this becomes completely a, a family decision. The child didn't have the opportunity to have an advanced directive because the child wasn't having that thought. And so I think that is a unique struggle for families, and families come with so many different perspectives on what is meaningful for their child's life. And so, for example, in, in our setting at Kennedy Krieger, we take children for rehab who are in a vegetative state or mentally conscious state regularly because there's no nursing home settings for children in the state of Maryland. So children who have that level of need automatically come for rehab. And so as a result, some of those children leave our institute still in a vegetative state. And I've seen families who are devastated to take their children home in that state, where I've seen other families who are able to put meaning on their child's responses that we as a team don't believe are responses to the environment are more reflexive responses. But for them, having their child alive is um, meaning enough, and they're able to kind of progress with that child and bond with that child, even though the, the child is not um, responding to them on an individual <coughs> level. So there's really just a range of responses from families in how to, um, how they handle children with a disorder of consciousness from um, early on in rehab to, to later on in, in life. Yeah, thank you so much for that perspective on children, and I think what I'm sure you agree with this, is that uh, children are much more dynamical systems, uh, their brains uh, have more plasticity, and uh, you know, it's reasonable to, I think, believe, and uh, there's data to support this, that uh, children um, can recover in, in ways that are not seen in adults. Uh, and so, so this is a, it, it sort of engages a whole other set of uh, questions uh, and ethical there are dimensions and perspectives of the sort of intrinsic plasticity of the brain and children and uh, the ability to recover, which um, unfortunately I think is lost over time and not seen in older individuals. Uh, would you agree with that? Or, yes? uh, well, I would say that in some cases, but also younger children who have more diffuse injuries are more vulnerable to injuries. If they haven't yet developed skills and have a diffuse injury, they're even less likely. So um, I think plasticity and vulnerability are both things that we need to consider um, in the developing brain. And it, it, both of those issues make prognosticating very difficult. Um, even I agree that it's easier to prognosticate further along. Uncertainty decreases with time. But when children come to rehab in a disorder of consciousness, there's still so much uncertainty. Um, with, with what to expect. Etiology certainly uh, plays a role. So children with anoxic brain injury might be, you would be less uncertain than a child with traumatic brain injury. But there's there's still a lot of uncertainty. And so we, we spend a lot of time trying to answer that question, will my child wake up, and how best they, they answer that. Dr. Uh, I just wanted to enlarge a little bit 
on the very, very young, in other words, the neonatal before uh, humans have developed language and meaningful interaction. And there, the field of understanding coma and wakefulness and vegetative state is much affected by the fact that we make a lot of our decisions on our clinical examination by getting a response. Now, in a neonate that can't answer, cannot uh, process information in a meaningful way and answer you, as it were, uh, but has reflex evidence of wakefulness, the distinction between wakefulness and consciousness is extremely difficult because you don't have the ability to find out, you know, lift your right arm, lift your left. So in those sorts of situations, uh, there is a lot more reserve in making prognostication on whether the infant is comatose, is vegetative, will recover. So what I was talking about earlier on are adult situations that we understand far better. Thank you very much. So there's another panel member that we have here, uh, John Canella. And I wanted to ask John about um, the, the family dynamic and how we engage with families uh, in when we take care of patients who are unresponsive or unconscious. Um, and and there's, there, are, there are many, many different scenarios, but one of the ones that is most striking is when there's kind of a dissonance or a disconnect between the perceptions of the, the, the medical team and the perceptions of the family. For example, with respect to the likelihood of recovery, um, it's quite common, uh, as many of you know, that uh, the medical team will, on the basis of their experience, the clinical exam, the testing, will come to the unfortunate conclusion that a patient's likelihood of recovery is, is very low or, or inexistent. Um, and, and then we have families who are so far away from us saying, absolutely not. Uh, we know, I, I know in my heart of hearts that he's going to recover, he's going to wake up. Um, and you hear this, this kind of uh, discourse going on, which is so removed from what we're trying to, uh, to explain. And I guess my question for John is, you know, how do we bridge this gap? Sometimes it seems like it's just that there's a huge chasm between, again, the team and the families, and it seems like almost impossible to, to make a connection. So what are your thoughts? Yeah, the answer is very simple, because I worked for an individual who raised the dead and uh, is the blind. So, uh, and, uh, Patients and families, and uh, even the medical teams. I mean, I often perceive that. I mean, uh, I mean, the families believe that I mean, Chapman is here to raise this person, and, uh, and then for medical team, okay, it's off our hands. And uh, and uh, imagine this. I mean, all of this knowledge. This is power. How difficult is it? it is to process for all of us in our cognitive sense. And at the time of your loved one being challenged with the death. To understand all this information, I mean, uh, how you are translating all this information into words and how much is being understood by the family. I mean, if my loved one does not meet the criteria, the definition of death by biological criteria, so that means my loved one does not meet the criteria by the cardiac death as well. So that means there is life. So it is very difficult for families to walk between the hope and the helpless feeling. So my role often comes into interaction with the mental team, so whenever this question comes, shall we pull the plug? So my assessment is how much is being understood by the family, and what is their story? What is their uh, uh, psychosocial dynamic? There is always uh, layers underneath. My aunt came through this. Oh, he pulled last time, so he's going to do this. To understand that, but I'm also to provide the paid consultation I think that's where bridging the gap between the medical team and bringing these uh, two perceptions to meet at a point. I mean, uh, is there a possibility to engage in uh, meaningful conversations? It doesn't happen with the one family meeting. I work with these uh, two great doctors, and uh, sometimes, I mean, uh, there are some challenges. And uh, if we tell to the families that your loved one is not going to live, then uh, I mean, uh, we have to prepare for the consequences as well, both as a faith community, as the doctors too. So I'd just like to make a, a comment quickly, because a lot of what we're talking about is, <clears throat> I think, an artifact of modern medicine, especially of modern resuscitation and critical care. 
you know, if you think about it, 100 years ago, if you sustained um, a severe traumatic brain injury, you know, the chances are that uh, that brain injury would lead to um, major uh, systemic complications in a very short period of time. You would stop breathing, your blood pressure would become out of control, and you would die. So the neurological injury would lead to injury of the organism in a very short, defined period of time, maybe minutes to hours. But thanks to modern resuscitation, in a sense, neurologic injury, neurologic damage, and neurologic death has been become disconnected from death of the other organs. And so this is best illustrated in patients that we see in the intensive care unit all the time. These are patients who have arrived at a state of death by neurologic criteria. So there's no longer any function that's detectable in the brain <coughs> with extensive testing. Um, and yet, their heart is still beating. They still have a pulse. They still have color in their face. Their kidneys are working. Their liver is working. But this is an artifact. It's an artifact of intensive care medicine because these patients are on a ventilator which is maintaining oxygenation and removing carbon dioxide, it's maintaining homeostasis. So it's artificially sustaining all the different organs, although the brain is dead. Um, and this can become very, very complicated and difficult for many, many people to understand. You say to them, your loved one is dead, uh, has met criteria for brain death. Um, they walk into the room and they see somebody whose cheeks are, are you know, a normal color, who has a pulse, who looks like he or she is breathing even though that breathing is sustained by the ventilator. Um, none of this would have existed you know, before uh, the advent of modern, uh, modern intensive care medicine. And so, so you know, in a way, you have this kind of protracted, decoupled process of dying that was never seen before. Does that make sense? Yeah. OK, questions from any questions? Yes, ma'am. I think there's a, there's a fine line in consciousness and need you walk as clinicians to make sure that we are promoting recovery, um, however not causing harm, right? No, cause no harm. So um, in thinking about stimulation, our brains need stimulation. Um, one of the uh, false uh, information that's out there uh, still is that, oh, my loved one has had a brain injury, let's turn off the light, let's have no noise in the room, let's not expose them, they need quiet and they need, you know, nothing happening. And we know the evidence is just mounting of how the balance of stimulation um, and return to normal biorhythms, normal uh, regulation of uh, function uh, facilitates recovery. And so, use of stimulation, it, it should be used carefully and judiciously so that there is exposure, normal natural exposure, so that you can get those response patterns while watching to make sure that we're not leading to overstimulation or causing undue pain for that individual. So I think it's, it's really a, a, a walking a, a, an observation trial with those individuals on an individual basis, we don't have enough evidence. And you know, uh, all the rehabilitation folks in the room, we're, we're walking that line, and we're pushing the envelope of what we know about rehabilitative care in, in those critical care settings. And so I, I encourage us to keep doing that, uh, though mindfully. Just, just to add to that, I would encourage you to think about, if you're using noxious stimuli, what's the purpose of it? Is it are you trying to do, you know, in, in the ICU, if you're doing uh, frequent neuro checks, that may be really important. In rehab, when somebody is medically stable, is you, are you using noxious stimuli as a way to in, induce arousal and increase wakefulness? And if that's the case, um, you know, there, you could potentially use that, but there's other measures like for example, as a neuropsychologist, when I want to do an assessment and I have a child who's not um, easily awakened, 
I'll go see that child in physical therapy when they have them um, up in the stander or up in a mat, something else that promotes arousal. So, you know, for example, one measure, um, the Tacoma Recovery Scale Revised has an arousal protocol where some of you might be familiar with them. If a, if a person is asleep, you, you want to kind of pinch them down one side of their body and up the other side of their body, and if you start it, you're supposed to finish that. Um, I tend not to use that because I think it's overly noxious and that there's other ways to promote arousal to get a good exam, which is the purpose of, of doing that initially is to make sure you're maximizing arousal before you measure responsiveness. So I'd encourage you to think about the reason that you're doing noxious stimuli and what you're hoping So we're reaching the, uh, yes, go ahead. Yes. I think that when you're thinking about stimuli and providing noxious stimuli, uh, you have to have some sort of baseline assessment of how much disorder of consciousness you think you have, and then try to match the noxious stimuli to overcome that threshold. Um, you don't want to obviously provide too much so that you are unduly giving pain to somebody who may actually be able to feel it. But at the same time, you need to make a real assessment you have to provide enough stimulation to cross that threshold to get the stimulation that you want. Uh, thinking about, uh, as an anesthesiologist in the operating room doing neurosurgery frequently, uh, we will provide electrical painful stimuli to the arms and legs in an effort to try and measure it in the brain, even under general anesthesia, as a way to monitor the course of the surgery. Well, surefire way to cross the anesthetic threshold is to have the voltage turned up too much, right? People, patients waking up, right? But, they're not actually, but they are enough stimuli to bring them out of a general anesthetic. Similarly, even in any brain death exam, the first part of a brain death exam, hello, Mr. Jones, can you open your eyes? It starts at the very, very bottom level, the minimum stimulation that would be considered natural and normal. And then it goes all the way up to the most painful things you could possibly imagine to try and cross that threshold. Again, because brain death is absolute, we want to make sure that so we take a little bit of the uh, aggressive nature as far as noxious goes. Doesn't Dr. Castle. So just one, one comment for prognostication using electrophysiology, meaning the brain waves and the evoked potentials. The evoked potentials, by definition, are a noxious stimulus to see if it gets to the sexual pathway. And that's an all or none in terms of measurement does bilaterally or it doesn't. For EEG and a number of causes of coma, it is the ability to show that the brain waves are reactive to external noxious stimuli which determine the likelihood of recovery versus not. To make it black and white, a brain that shows no change in its EEG pattern is, has a very poor prognosis. The only situation in which it's a little bit different is when you have sleep patterns. And you want to see whether, since the person is clinically unresponsive because they are asleep, if you give them an obvious stimulation and you can wake them up, and the way you diagnose sleep also is by the EEG pattern, otherwise they look like any eyes closed person. That way, you can, with an obvious stimulus, you can determine whether you reach out or left a sleeping state of unresponsiveness. But I, I wanted to thank uh, the person at the, at, the, at the back there who asked this question, because it is really a value question, right? So certainly uh, we, you know, we deliver noxious stimulants that it may have prognostic significance, it may allow us to assess the current state of our patients. Um, but I think we should only use it if we believe that the information we're going to get outweighs the potential for harm to the patient. And the reason I say that is because there is actually very good data to suggest that, again, a subset of patients with disorders of consciousness can um, sense pain. They are sensitive to painful stimuli, and they may suffer quite significantly uh, if you deliver it. So if you believe, as a, uh, a person at the bedside, that the information you're going to retrieve from an auction stimulus is so valuable that it outweighs the potential for causing pain, then I think it becomes reasonable to entertain it. But it is, it is a quandary. Every time you know, I'm at the bedside uh, pressing on a patient's nail to see if I can get a response, I'm thinking, 
you know, this is crazy, what am I doing? But at the same time, I'm thinking, okay, well, you know, I'm actually learning something about my patient which may be of value to him and to, to the family. So I think we're, we're, um, we're coming, you know, to the, to the end of this, uh, this lunch session. I want to thank all of the members of the panel. I want to thank all of you for coming here. Uh, this was really great. Thank you so much. conversation today points out um, the challenges in dealing with um, the spectrum of neurologic uh, awareness and consciousness, that it provokes a lot of fundamental ethical questions for us. What's the meaning we associate with dying, our preferences around how we live, quality of life, and the word that has been repeated many times today is uncertainty. And so this is a situation where we're left with how do we relate to uncertainty? Do we see uncertainty as a threat and therefore we ought to stop our efforts now before um, the outcome is completely known? Or do we see it as opportunity and hopeful for recovery? And I think what we've heard here is there's a lot of uncertainty. And I think for many of these cases, what we're left with is the question of ethical permissibility. There's no one right answer often in these cases. And I think that that is very difficult for those of us who rely on science for these answers to live with. And so in many cases, I think what we're left with is what can the people who are involved in these situations, what can they live with? And how do we make sense of the process that we are involved with as clinicians and how do we live with the participation that we have and the consequences of the care that we're giving. So I want to thank our, our panel for bringing these issues to us. Clearly these are issues we're going to struggle with and I would argue that these are issues we probably ought to struggle with. So thank you for being here.